property. There are two types of property in law, and it's the same in business law. Personal and real property. Real property is real estate, is your house, is land. Personal property is your watch and your bracelet and your iPad. Now, simply because personal property can be a watch or a phone, it applies to business because if you've got a hundred acres and you've got three warehouses on it and each warehouse has a hundred machines that are as big as this room, okay, manufacturing is personal property. Trucks are personal property. Software, personal property. Computers, anything that is not fixed to the ground is personal property. So when you ride by, if you're on the interstate and you ride by Samsung or Komatsu up here, and you see all of those bulldozers parked out there, and you see that huge building, the first thing you think is, look at the size of that building of Samsung. Look at the size of that Komatsu building. The building is nothing. It's the interior. It's the contents. It's the machines. It's the bulldozers. Those are all personal property. And they're no different than your watch or your phone or your iPad. The law is exactly the same for a bulldozer as it is for your watch. Personal property has to have three things. Ownership, Possession and title. It is not unusual, and it's not unusual in one of my tests, it's not unusual to only have two of the three. To have two of the three. If you have bought, um, you know, if you've bought Five thousand computers, ten thousand computers, and you bought them from Japan, and they are put on a boat and they go across the Pacific Ocean, come through the Panama Canal, and when you bought the computers, you paid for them, and when you paid for them, you got a receipt from the Japanese computer company, and the the ship goes through the Panama Canal and it comes up the East Coast and it comes to the port of Charleston and there's so many containers stacked up at the port that the ship and others out there, this is, this is actually, the truth actually, there are four ships right now that are just going up and down about two miles out in the ocean and they're just going up and down until they are told to come into the harbor and unload their big things that sit on the back of 18 wheelers. Right now the, the port of North Charleston has too many containers. And you, you have ownership, you have title, but you don't have possession. So it's not yours. The law is unclear. You can have lawsuits about that all the time, but you have to have ownership, possession, and title. Sometimes you might have possession. 
Sometimes you might have ownership and you might have possession, but you don't have title. Can anybody think of an example? Uh, a car is sold? Car. Used cars, the used car dealer goes to an auction and they'll buy 15 or 20 used cars and they'll put them on one of those 18 wheelers that stack the cars up and they'll take them to their used car lot and clean them up and you go in there and say I'd like to buy that used car and you buy it and say where's my title and the, the used car lot owner says oh well the auction house is going to mail me the title. You think that's going to happen? No, it's because the cars are stolen. All right, so you go to the auction, they sell the cars without titles. And so no telling where the car came from. So you can still buy the car, but then you have to go to the DMV and get a lost title form and fill out a lost title form and it's just it, you got to jump through hoops and it's a pain in the butt. But you would have ownership possession, but you would have to go apply to get your title. My point is, I want you to know these three things. And I want you to know that personal property includes everything that's not land. Right? Everything that's not land is personal property. Except for one example I'm fixing to tell you. Right, real property. Land and fixtures. A fixture is attached to the land and becomes part of the land. The easiest example is a farm with a barn. Okay? If you buy a farm and there is a barn on it, that barn is part of the land, just as if it was a piece of corn. The fixture is connected to the land. So if you buy land in a subdivision and there's a house on it, you're obviously buying the house and the land. And that's, that's obvious in a subdivision, but when it's somewhere out in the country, the barn may be a fixture, but next to the barn may be a tractor or maybe a metal building that's fallen down. Those are not fixtures because they can be removed. Now in South Carolina, we got a bunch of international. Who's from South Carolina? Uh, not even half. Okay. In South Carolina, we got a problem with bad schools. All right. We want our schools to be better. Well, South Carolina schools are paid with property taxes, with the taxes that are on land. And so every county, they have somebody go along and they say that mansion over there with that pool that's sitting on Lake Murray, that's worth $1.2 million and their property taxes are $10,000 a year. But we've got a bunch of mobile homes, a bunch of mobile homes all over the state. And if a mobile home has wheels on it, even if it hadn't moved in 20 years, if it has wheels on it, it is not a fixture. It is personal property. So the landowner pays for that vacant lot. So there may be 10 kids living in that mobile home going to public schools and the property taxes are $200 because that's all the land that's worth. As soon as you take the wheels off the mobile home, and put it on cement blocks, you have made it a fixture, and the property taxes go from $200 a year up to $2,000 a year. And, and that, that's a real issue in South Carolina, is the taxation of mobile homes. All right, land and fixture. How do you get it? 
a grantor sells to a grantee. The sale is made by a deed. A deed is nothing more than a piece of paper that says Leon sells to Maggie. Except that that deed on the first page in every deed has what's called a property description. That property description, the term property description, that's a legal term, okay? That doesn't just mean a description of the property. The property description says you go 500 yards to GPS 3.2, and then you go east 100 yards to GPS 4.8, and then you go south and you describe the property. Now, because South Carolina is the second oldest state in the country, we have deeds that go back to the 1600s that may be for 14,000 acres in Charleston or Berkeley or Georgetown counties that may be for 14,000 acres, and that property description will say you go three miles to the old crooked tree and then you turn south and you go 10 miles to the creek, you know, and the property descriptions are very vague. Well, when you buy something, you want to make sure that that property description is what you're buying. If you're buying 100 acres, you don't want to find out that you only got 99. So your lawyer goes back 70 years Go to the courthouse, some counties you might can do it online, but you go to the courthouse and you look through the deeds and you find, you know, let, let's say that, that that address is number one Sycamore Street. You go through those deeds for 70 years until you find where number one Sycamore Street was made. It was split off from two lots. And so then you go to the next buyer and you find out 10 years later it was bought by Mr. Smith. And then you go to the next buyer, and five years later it was bought by Mr. Jones. And you go 70 years, and every time it was bought and sold, you check the property description. And if you ever come across a property description that's different, you have to fix it before you can buy the land. You have to get a lawyer and they have to fix the property. Maybe it's a um, typo. Okay? Maybe it's a typo. A famous typo in law school, what we were all told about somebody that uh, put an R in the word county and made it country. And somebody was buying a country instead of a county. All right? So you have to check every word, every letter to make sure it's the same, make sure you're getting the same property and you do that for 70 years. All right. Now, tour, grantee, deed. Where does the grantee get the money? <coughs> May have it cash, but probably not. Where do they get it? They get it from a bank. And the bank gets from the grantee a mortgage. The mortgage says, if you don't repay me my money, if you don't repay the bank the money that you owe us, we get your property. That's what the mortgage says. We can come in and we will own your property if you don't make all the payments. Now, if a mortgage company might 
Probably not, but they might end up with the property. What does the mortgage company want to know before it gives that money? What's one of the things it's going to want to know? Well, the credit score, but what else? Huh? Not how much the property is worth. What's the next? You're on the right line. What? The property description. The property description is important to the person buying it because they want to make sure they're getting 100 acres and not 99 acres, but the property description is also important for the mortgage company in case they end up with the property. They don't want to have somebody stop paying the money and then they go ride by the property and find out that they've divided it in two and, and given two people, you know, giving it to their brothers or their sisters or something. So the property description for the mortgage is just as important. All right, one, well, a couple more things, and this, this is fun. It's a little more fun. was told by his boss go buy a hundred acres so Mr. Stokoski goes out and rides around Newberry County looking at looking, using a drone and looking at tax maps and he finds a hundred acres and he goes back to his boss and says I have found us a hundred acres just what we're looking for and his boss congratulates him and they buy it and they build a warehouse on it and fill it full of equipment. Now the warehouse is now what? A fixture. A fixture. Once they build a warehouse, now you've got a hundred acres and a warehouse, so it's a fixture. Right? And Mr. Stokoski was uh, in charge of making sure that 70 acres, I mean that 70 years was done. Alright, so his boss said, did you get somebody to go 70 years? Did you do it? Did you get a lawyer to do it? Yeah, no problem, no problem. Alright, so they put a fence. They're making computer chips. They don't want anybody to, their, to steal their technology. So they put a fence all the way around 100 acres. And everybody's happy. And then an old lady comes along the road and goes to turn in her driveway to go to her house, and her road is blocked. And she calls the CEO, calls the manager, who then calls Sikoski and says, what, what is this? And you find out on the property description that there is a 10-foot wide easement. An easement gives somebody else the right to use your land. Somebody else the right to use your land. And it is in the property description. Now, if somebody searched the property, and search the property description, and there was no easement, they could just tell the old lady, I'm sorry, you're out of luck. But if there is an easement in the property description, and they bought the 100 acres, and they didn't allow for that 10 foot wide dirt road, then they have to move the fence, and she has to have access to her house. Easements are important. Easements are so important that they have to be in property descriptions. And so Stokoski is uh, demoted to janitor, and one of his jobs is to walk the, the dirt, I mean walk the forest, and he walks the forest, 
and he finds, oh my goodness, an old man living in the back corner. And he, he asked the old man, what are you living, doing living on my company's property? And the old man says, I have lived here all my life. And I have lived here more than 25 years. And if he has lived there for more than 25 years, that is called adverse possession. Now, easements are pretty common and usually easements settle themselves out pretty easily. Adverse possessions are lawsuits. Nobody's going to let somebody live back there and claim that they were there for 25 years. So you sue the, you sue the old man and you find his daughter that says, yeah, well, you know, I had cancer and he came and lived with me for a year, you know, or uh, he went to Jamaica for a vacation for two years. You, know, you find witnesses that break up the 25 years. Not he can go to the grocery store and back, but that he didn't live there for the full 25 years. And if he didn't live there for the full 25 years, then his adverse possession isn't any good. South Carolina is one of the few states that recognize adverse possession. So you do have to think about it, but it's not, not a huge issue. All right, finally. We got a road down here. And South Carolina comes along and tells Tarkovsky and company, we're going to take the first 20 yards of your land. And we're going to offer you $50,000 for it. Can they take the land? So that says yes. Absolutely. The government in America can take your land, period. But because of the British soldiers, what about the British soldiers taking our land? I told you about the British soldiers. So because the British soldiers used to take our land, what does the Constitution say about the government taking your land? Have to compensate and have to compensate how? Fairly. Fairly. Anybody got another word? Just compensation. Fifth and Fourteenth Amendment. Just does not mean like just pay us, you know, just pay us. It means justice. It means to pay fair, pay enough. So the state of South Carolina can take your land, but they have to pay for it. So the, they offer $50,000 for this area, and Tukoski and Company says, no, we want $200,000. And the state of South Carolina says, well, we pay these people fifty, dollars and we pay these people fifty, dollars so we're only going to pay you fifty. dollars Tukoski and Company says, we want 200. So you sue the state of South Carolina. It's a lawsuit. It's with a jury. It goes through litigation. But the only issue is the value of the land. It's a little quick lawsuit. Because you can't argue they can't do it. Right? I mean, they, they can do it. So the state calls real estate in, um, appraisers and the real estate appraiser for the state says it's worth $50,000. Mr. Kosky calls a real estate appraiser, and the real estate appraiser says it's worth $300,000 because we've done sewer work and pipe work and all of that. And the jury comes back and says we award the state of South Carolina $10,000 or $60,000. It doesn't matter what it is. But whatever the jury says, that's the bottom line. That's what you get. Period. And, and, and believe it or not, I've tried a couple of those cases, and, and juries, juries take a lot of time on it. They really try to figure it out. 
And sometimes they come up with some weird figures. Okay, they don't just split the difference. They, they look at it and they might ask the judge if they can drive out and look at it. Juries take it pretty, pretty serious. All right? One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve, thirteen, fourteen. And on a final exam for property, it's, it's pretty easy to say you have formed whatever business you formed, corporation or, or LLC, whatever business that you formed, and you put together a management team, and that management team bought land, and on that land, there was a railroad track, or there was a railroad car, there was, there was a, somebody living behind it, okay? So you would have formed a business, you would have had managers buying land, and you would have had to talk about grantor and grantee, you would have had to talk about deeds, you would have had to talk about property descriptions, but that's not hard. Okay, it's pretty straightforward. Any questions on property?